we as a church here at Christ Church are trying to understand ever more fully what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That's what we say, isn't it? And, you know, the danger is it becomes like a little sticker you put in your Bible and you forget about it. So we have to kind of explore again and again what this actually means, you know, don't we? Now, you all know of this country called Sierra Leone. And you all know that there's a terrible disease spreading across that area called Ebola. And huge numbers of people are dying at the moment. And if you were to think where you might want to go on holiday, it will probably be about the, be at the last place on earth you'd think of going. Now, Jimmy here, as all, we all know, one of our church members, has been going to Sierra Leone and trying to help them build up their resources and their, you know, their buildings and so on, helping victims of polio, for example. For many, many years, he's been going there. I want you to come, Jimmy, would you, and just share briefly what, um, what you're wrestling with as a, as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus Christ. Can you tell us, please? Yes, I can, Martin. Is that on, yeah? Um, um, as you all know, Sierra Leone is in the uh, west side of, of Africa, so the west of Africa, and it has just gone through a, a bloody war for about 16 years. They're, the people are off Sierra Leone were getting their lives together. Hence, what has happened, this outbreak of Ebola has hit them again. Now, at this moment in time, on the streets, there's orphans. Parents are putting the children out onto the streets. A friend of mine who's there, who we work with, they have just taken in 300 children off the streets uh, just to give them shelter and food. So Ebola is a thing that is killing people, right? and it could be an academic. Millions of people could be affected by it. But what I want to say to you this morning is this, that people have been saying to me, Jimmy, you cannot go back there because Ebola will get you, it will kill you. And I am saying, listen, what, um, what uh, our Lord said to Peter, and Peter said, Lord, this can never happen to you. you must, this must not happen to you. And what did our Lord say to him? He said, get behind me, Satan. Here was Peter who I shall build my church. He said, get behind me, Satan. So I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters this morning, I want to really encourage you. If your life has been challenged to do something for the Lord and something is trying to stop you doing it, say, get behind me, Satan. You have no authority over me. See, if I go to Surrey Leon, I'm going in the strength of the Lord. And I am going back, and Jackie will tell you, hopefully in November, and to build what God wants me to build. I never knew this was going to happen. I do plead with you this morning, my brothers and sisters, I'm doing a golf day at Mentmore on the 10th of October and trying to raise funds. So if anyone can help me at all, to help those in Sierra Leone, please see me afterwards. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, all my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Jimmy. So there, in a nutshell, you have, in a very dramatic and extreme form, what discipleship might be, mean for one person. Does he stay in Luton with Jackie, his wife, or does he follow what he believes the call of God is, go to Sierra Leone? For you... It may be something much smaller, not quite as dramatic as that, but that gives us a little taste of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you stand? Let's carry on our worship. I interrupted that because I felt we need to focus on why we're here. We're, once again, it's lovely to see you. Would you like to pl find Matthew's Gospel in the New Testament, please? And chapter 25. We're going to a wedding this morning. Matthew 25. And chapter, uh, starting to read at verse 1. What, what uh, page number is that, uh, Jackie? Uh, oh, sorry, you're a different Bible. What's the page? 994. <laughs> Page 994. Good. 
Let's find out what's happening at this wedding. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, He is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of the Lord. I feel a bit boomy. Do I sound boomy this morning? Could you cut down the boom a bit? working on cutting out the boom. So here we have a story, a parable that Jesus tells. We have a wedding banquet. Weddings are beautiful, happy occasions. And in this day, in the, in the biblical times, um, there would be lots of bridesmaids, ten in this case, ten bridesmaids, they call them virgins here, young women. And the women will be preparing for the arrival, that important moment when the bridegroom arrives, probably at the bride's house, actually, to take her off with himself to his house. So the bridesmaids, all ten of them, are getting ready, and uh, they have the, their lamps, have their lamps filled with oil. But as often happens at weddings, people turn up rather late. So this bridegroom turns up um, very late, and they'd all gone to sleep, uh, all ten of them, by the time he comes, by the time the news arrives that he's about to arrive. He's on his way. So the lamps have gone out, um, and only half of the bridesmaids, only five of them, have got a, an extra supply of oil to fill up their lamps quickly and uh, light up the way for the bridegroom as he arrives at his bride's house. The other five don't have a backup supply of oil. So they get sent off by the, 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 the wise five down the road to Budgeons to buy some oil. And then when they come back with their, some new supply of oil, they find that the door of the wedding banquet has been shut in their face. And the word comes that the bridegroom doesn't even know who they are and they're left out there in the night and as is so often the case with parables of Jesus then there comes this pithy unforgettable saying therefore he says keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour when the bridegroom who is of course himself the Lord Jesus Christ will come again we need to be ready. Tough message. Very tough message. And it actually comes in a sequel of extremely tough messages that uh, Jesus is giving. You might like to look back to chapter 22, a few chapters earlier. Chapter 22. Here we've got another banquet. Another wedding banquet. And at this banquet, the... Um, the king is calling all the people in, all the people from the highways and byways to come to this uh, banquet. Everybody's invited. But the trouble is, 
that um, one person turns up at the end with not without the correct clothes on and he's not allowed to come into the wedding feast and Jesus ends that uh, little bit of teaching there uh, saying another pithy saying many are invited but few are chosen so it goes on from chapter 22 this tough teaching about the um, the the kingdom of God what is it like in the kingdom of God and then when you get to chapter 25 the tension is growing and growing and growing because Jesus has been giving all this teaching teaching not to just anybody but to the elite spiritual leaders of the day to the Pharisees and you can imagine their blood pressure going up and up and up. What is this man saying to us? What are we going to do with him? He's going on and on and on. Gets to chapter 25. He, has, he preaches the, the parable that I've just told you about of the wedding feast and the five bridesmaids not having a backup supply of oil. Then he goes on, chapter 25, verse 14, to another parable. Here we've got the story of a whole load of guys who've got some bags of gold. Some of them make something of their bags of gold when the master goes away, but one of them who's got one bag of gold just does nothing with it at all. He doesn't make anything of his inheritance, of his wealth. And again, he's sent away. He's sent away. And then, chapter 25, the third of the parables in this sequel here. It's headed here, the sheep and the goats, verse 31. Jesus tells a parable, basically, where the message is this. There's lots of messages, but the central message I want to draw out is that those who do not go to the rescue of people in deep need also won't be invited into the kingdom of God. Only those who respond with charity and mercy and love to those in deepest need will make it in. And then, chapter 26, after all this teaching that's been accumulating, what do we read? Chapter 26. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is, is two days away, and the Son of Man, that's Jesus, the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. This is Jesus. This is the choice he's giving his people. Before our service, one of the other words that came to us as we prayed was that Jesus, the Son of God, is both gentle Lamb of God, but he's also the Lion of Judah. He's both a gentle, sweet Lamb, but he's also a roaring Lion. Now, in the beginning of our Bibles, my friends, we read that God made man in his image. You may have heard it said, yes, God made man in his image, and man returned the compliment. Man returned the compliment. Man learnt how to make God in man's image. We need to be very careful there's a danger that we and religious people of all ages make God to be like we are. We want a kind of God who won't shut the door on the five virgins who have no backup supply. That's the kind of God I would like there to be. This is not the kind of God who is revealing himself through his son Jesus Christ in the scriptures this morning. This is a theme 
that runs through the whole Bible. In Jeremiah, in chapter 18, God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house and just watch the potter. Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house and there he sees the potter fashioning a, a, a vessel. He doesn't quite get it right, so he break, puts that one down and he has another go until he gets it right. And the message from the Lord to Jeremiah is, I am the potter and my people are the clay. And I have the right, Father God says, to fashion my people as I want to fashion them. Now the trouble is that religious people of all ages want to reverse that and have God as the clay on the wheel and we as the potters. What kind of God might we like to have? This theme is picked up throughout the scriptures, particularly in the book of Isaiah. If you have a look at Isaiah 44 and verse 12, fasten your safety belts. Isaiah 44 and verse 12. This is shocking stuff. The blacksmith takes a tool and works with it, with it with the, in the coals. He shapes an idol with, his, with hammers. He forges it with the, right, with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in human form, human form in all its glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. He cuts down cedars, or perhaps took a cypress or an oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest, or planted a pine, and the rain made it grow. It is used as fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and fills his fi eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, oh, I am warm, I see the fire. From the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He, he prays to it and says, Save me, you are my God. They know nothing, writes Isaiah. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so that they cannot see and their minds are closed so that they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I used for fuel. I even baked breads over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such people feed on ashes. A deluded heart misleads them. They cannot save themselves or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? There's prophet Isaiah exposing idolatry for what it is. Man fashioning a God as he chooses. And as the psalmist says in Psalm 135, Psalm 130, don't feel you have to look this up, but 135, verse 15, the idols of the nations are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouth. And here comes the haunting verse. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. There we have it. The danger of man or woman making a God in his or her own image. Right? The God he makes, the God is impotent to help him. But it's something that goes on, and it goes on right through hist history in all religious people. When I was at theological college, we were given lots of things to think about, and you went and wrote your essays about them. The, the most haunting thought 
that came to me was through the, 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 um, the, the philosophy of a man called Feuerbach, a German philosopher. And basically he said, yes, people are religious, yeah, but they all make their gods as they choose. They all make their gods as a reflection of who they are. And the reason this was such a haunting thing to me, which I didn't, still to this day, I've not let go of, is because when you actually stop and look at this stuff, you realize the kernel of truth that is in it. Look at ISIL. They are violent, savage, evil people who think nothing of beheading people who come to the rescue of their people um, as a, 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 help, a, 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 um, a relief worker and, and beheading them. ISIL have made a god, small g, in their own image. The god that ISIL worships is like the philosophy and the practice of ISIL. Do you see? But friends, we have to be really wise and discerning here because every culture is in danger of making a God in its own image. Let's ask ourselves the question. If we were to make a, a God in the image of our culture, what might our God, small g, look like? I suggest to you that he would be cool, chilled, all forgiving, and that wonderful English word, nice, and at all costs, not extreme. If we had that God in the parable that Jesus tells about the wise and the foolish bridesmaids, would this kind of God, chilled, cool, all forgiving God, exclude them from the wedding ban banquet? No! That's all right. Don't worry if you didn't have enough oil. We'll just wait for you to come. It's fine. We're very, very soft and sweet and Anglican here. Don't worry. Just uh, come when you're ready. I'm very happy to wait till you're here. very easy to look at other, other religious groups and see how they've made their God in their image. But what about us? Let's turn the focus on ourselves. The message of the parable is that Jesus, the bridegroom, is returning. Yes, he's returning at the end of time, but he's also returning all the time into our lives as he returned into Jimmy's life now, just, so, just said now, and, and said, Jimmy, um, actually, I want you to go to Sierra Leone. I know everybody may say you're completely stupid to think of going to Sierra Leone. Even Jackie may say you're stupid to go there, Jimmy. But, but, and with good reason. But Jesus may be saying to Jimmy, yes, somebody has to go to the help. Maybe Jimmy has to go. Jesus is returning all the time into our lives and challenging us. Will we be ready when he comes? Will we have actually enough oil reserved up, ready to keep our lamp burning when we're called to do something? We sing a song Sometimes, we, it's a bit out of date now, but when I was younger, we used to sing a song that went like this. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Keep me burning to the break of day. Wonderful song, lovely song. Brings me back fond memories of the 1980s with my little children. <coughs> Um, great song, but it's kind of saying, come on, God, 
give me the oil I need. I just need you to give me all the oil, and then I'll be ready to keep burning. But this parable, friends, is saying, God is saying to us, it's down to you, down to you to have the extra backup supply of oil ready. It's your job, not God's job. He's just not going to fill it up from heaven like that. You've got to keep filled up. Or else is the plain face of the text. Or else. I think the oil symbolizes, therefore, spiritual capital. We all know about keeping a healthy bank balance. If you let it go too far down and you buy something too expensive, you get into the red, you get a letter from the bank saying you've got an overdraft and you have to pay extra money. And as Jimmy, uh, sorry, as Nigel will tell us, many, many people get into debt financially. Yeah? I'm talking now about spiritual capital, this oil that the parable tells us we need to have. Somebody told me the other day that the reason they fell into sin was because they didn't have enough spiritual capital in their bank. They, weren't, they were just con, kind of gone lukewarm about God and the Bible, and then they fell. We have to keep our lamps burning and keep the supply up Jesus' message for these parables is make something of your bag of gold. Do arrive at, with the right clothes for the wedding feast. Do have enough oil supply. Make sure that you're active in helping the less fortunate. That's the sum of his teaching through these chapters. And it doesn't lead to people saying, oh, what a lovely new rabbi we've got. Isn't he? great. Let's have a party with Jesus and um, say thank you Father God for sending this, this lovely Jesus. No. All the religious leaders say we can't have this teaching. It's too tough. We've got to have him put down. We've got to have him killed. Jesus knew this was going to happen. That's why he said to Peter, get behind me Satan. When Jesus tried to prevent him from going forward to the cross. This is tough stuff, my friends. God expects us to fulfill our part of the deal. And he says, only those who do this will be chosen. Now, you need to understand this. I grew up in Harlow, Essex in the 1960s. So everything within me rebels against this teaching. I would much rather have the sweet lamb of, uh, of God in my Jesus than the roaring lion of Judah. I would, everything in me rebels against this. Ask Margareta. I'm terribly indisciplined person. Awfully indisciplined. I don't put my socks in the right place. I leave a mess in the kitchen. I can't get my papers in order. I don't look at the bank balance. I don't answer my letters. Or, you know, this is the sort of person I am, isn't it? You know, I'm not like somebody of my father's generation who was disciplined and rigorous. Everything rebels against me, in me, against this teaching of Jesus. I would much rather it wasn't in the Bible, frankly. You see, the reason that we've rejected discipline, religious discipline, is we think of religious discipline as being rather like Captain Mannering in Dad's Army. Do you remember Captain Mannering? Old school bank manager telling everybody off. Stupid boy, he would say. Yeah? Do you remember Dad? Uh, we think of discipline as being in that silly old-fashioned kind of way. But actually, I think that Jesus-like discipline is completely different to that. Jesus-like discipline is coming out of a well of love. A well of love that is so deep that it has no bottom to it. 
however deep you go into the well of Jesus' love, there's always more to come. It's, yeah, he, he, he will supply the oil, for the, back, the backup supplies of oil. He's saying, I just want to give you more and more oil of blessing. But for me to be able to give it, you've got to do your bit too. Otherwise, it's not a partnership. See, Jesus is saying, actually, I'm the bridegroom. You folks, you're my bride, and I love you with an undying love. But we're a partnership. Don't expect me to do it all. There's no partnership if I don't get something back from you. So you see, when we respond, however small a response it may be, and say, I'm going to pray today for five minutes, turn my mobile phone off, go on my own, God opens out all the blessings of heaven on, onto you because you said, I want more. I want to fill up my bank with oil. See? It's not Captain Mannering like discipline. I wonder if anybody, we heard from Jimmy, um, I wonder if anybody else would like to say what helps them keep up their, their supply of spiritual oil or, or spiritual capital. What works for you? It, I'd love to hear from one or two of you. What do you do? I know what many of you do, but what do you do in response to what Jesus is offering you? Come and say. What works for you? Well, okay. Shall I tell you what works for this man here? On a Sunday morning, he searches out a, a formal liturgical service of Holy Communion wherever it may be in Luton, and he travels there before he comes to this church for another service. Because he recognizes his need for liturgical worship keeps it very quiet. You didn't hear me say this. But that's how Ted fills up his spiritual bank of oil. It wouldn't work for me, but it works for him. Anybody like to come and say? Thank you, Nigel. Said in the past, but um, you know, I've always been you know, keen to read my Bible, and I've read it when I going back to when I was at work. I tended to read it last thing at night. You don't read it when you're wanting to rush off to the office, do you, or to catch the train. But in reality, you know, having been retired 20 years now, you know, I've actually had the privilege of being able to read my Bible at a time when it makes more sense. So I have my breakfast, wash the dishes, take the dog for a walk, and then come back. And most days, I will get on and read the Bible at that point. Now, this is a special privilege that I have as a retired person. But, you know, that discipline of reading the Bible whenever you can, I think is a absolutely crucial because, you know, our faith is set out there in the Bible. And if we don't spend time reading the Bible, where, how do we grow our faith? So for me, that's the most important part. She was just, she got started to move before you did, David. <laughs> Actually, it follows on Don't from what away. Nigel was saying. Um, I think the Bible is really important, as some of you know. But I think the thing is, you can read the Bible, and you have, maybe you have daily Bible notes, or if you've got a, a smartphone, a verse pops up at you or whatever. And sometimes you just think, Phew. or that's boring, or I don't understand it. But for me, it doesn't matter. You do it anyway even if it's boring or the feelings don't come or you don't understand it because it's like, as you say, putting money in the bank that you can draw on later. So for me, it doesn't really matter what you feel like, you do it anyway. Yes. 
Jim Martin's been talking about uh, for the last couple of weeks about wanting more and whether, you know, are we satisfied? I think it might have been last week. And, um, and I can remember sort of before I went to New Wine, and there's a parable of Jesus, Jesus talking to a lady in the well, next to the well, and he's talking about him being the, um, the water of life and you won't go thirsty anymore. And I keep on thinking, well, I don't experience that. I'm still thirsty. And so are you still thirsty? Are you still wanting more? Because that's where I was. And that's one of the reasons why I went to New Wine last summer, because you can get really saturated in a really nice way, spending a week um, in camping with God, you know, in his tabernacle, as it were. And I've sort of come back, and that's really made a difference. And one of the messages it said to me was to spend more time with him. And I've been trying to do that. And in the evening, not kind of having an agenda, I listen to a bit of worship music to start with. And, um, and I try and be quiet. And I talk to God about, you know, how's the day been? It might be a very brief conversation. Um, and just try and sort of practice being in his presence. But I'm reading this amazing book at the moment. Again, this comes out of New Wine, and it's called Incomparable by Andrew J. Wilson. And they're very, very short chapters, and it describes a character of God, like the Jew, Jesus being the, um, the Lion of Judah, as being one of them, which is what I talked about this morning. And little things like that, and it just helps you to meditate on actually who God is. And since I've reading that book and just having time to think about it, it's kind of really made, me a, made a difference, and it sort of encouraged me. I'm thinking, wow, God's like this. And so, yeah, it's about slightly practicing in God's presence. And you don't have to spend a long time doing that. But just sort of start off with some music, worship music, for about just play a track, and then be still. And then just sort of chat to God. <laughs> How are you feeling? Oh, I've had a really crap day today. It's been really horrible. Students really hard. What am I doing here? God knows all that, even before you open your mouth. So you might as well just tell him anyway. And then you can see what he says to you. Thank you, team. Do we have any street pastors here? Come on, come on. Um, because you see... We've heard some lovely contributions, but there's something more, and it's actually there in the last parable in Matthew 25. We've got two. Co- oh, fantastic. Pastor Moses is going to share with us, too. You asleep, Pastor? It's okay. It's okay. I've got many sisters having to meet. Oh, great, great. Well, we'll look forward to hearing from you, Pastor. Well, I'm a street pastor. What did you want me to say? Well, <laughs> no, that, that is amazing, what Mark just said. What do you want me to say? Because, you see... I'm going to steal your thunder now. Because when Jesus tells the last parable in Matthew 25, it's those who do all the good deeds like the street pastor. It's those who go out and look after... Come on, Chris, what are you doing with me? Oh, it's feedback from this. Um, it's it's the, um, those who go out... And feed the hungry, and, feed, and you know, and, and give something to drink to the thirsty, and visit the prisoner in prison. Who they say, well, when did we see you, Jesus? When, where were you? We didn't know about that. It's just like Mark's comment. What do you want me to say? Tell us what happens when you go out and do that stuff. So I was out last Saturday night. So for those of you who don't know, street pastoring is we go on the streets from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., um, which is quite tough. Um, and it ranges from people throwing up everywhere. Mind your feet, just sort of step back and <laughs> not go on your feet from people that just want to talk to people that just want to swear at us. We had one guy pull up get, uh, pull alongside us with his car, wound down his window and asked us for the time. So we were looking for the time. He told us to F off and drove off. Peace be with you. <laughs> Well, there's a little bit before that, but we, led, we left him with peace be with you, and that's the sort of stuff we get. And uh, we fed two homeless people, guys that hadn't eaten for four days. And they're coming up to us. They're not drunk. They're not on drugs. Genuine guys that are just in a dire situation. And we buy them chicken and chips. It's two, three pounds. And that has just, like, made their world for them that night. And they take it away and they eat, and they feel full. 
So that's our sort of filling of them with food, but obviously we're praying for them as well. So it is. Uh, it ranges. It doesn't really have a set night. He's not going to say this. I'm going to say this for him. As they fill, as Mark and the street pastors fill the hungry up with chicken and chips, his spiritual balance is going up. He's got more oil in his bank when he comes home than he had before he went out. The reason he's not saying it, he's humble. He's humble. I don't want to spoil it. Go and sit down, Mark. <laughs> Pastor Elijah. But no, no. Pastor Moses. Thank you, Reverend Martin. Good morning. Uh, what I wanted to say is mainly something that has helped to build me. I've attended the Bible College and uh, can say that I've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But after all that, I see myself still not fulfilled. And I began to ask myself why until I got to a point where I had to read and meditate upon Philippians 3.10, which is written by the Apostle Paul, and he said that I may know him. That I may know him. He's referring to Jesus. I quote, he said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Then 11 says, if by any means that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So I realized that memorizing the scripture right from the invite, invited commas, the semicolons and columns and the full stop and everything, you still have to find Jesus. Because sometimes the book talks about him, but it doesn't give us him. So we have to find him. So what did I do? I got out of my way and I start learning to meet Jesus, to know him every day. Now, I ask myself things like, what, what will Lord Jesus do in a case like this? What will he do? Or if he was here, would he be proud of what I've just done? So it begins to reflect on my life. It's not longer about, about the book because the book talks about him, but he is not the book. The book is not him. So I'm glad that the very moment I began to make my life a practical expression of what Jesus will do, then I began to find fulfillment. Thank you. Wonderful. We'll have you again to pass for this place. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're now going to uh, put this into practical, practical um, expression as we take up the collection, um, giving away something. And as we give this something away, again, it's the same inverted logic of the kingdom of God. As we give something away, we get more back. Why? Because we're giving back to God what was his anyway. This is the economy of God. Give away your tenth, and you get more than the tenth back. It may not be financially, but spiritually, your coffers in heaven, your oil supply grows. Do you believe that? Let's take up the collection then. Now, as Josh prays for us.
as Josh keeps playing now, um, two members of our PCC, Jackie and Rochelle, will be bringing around a letter for you, one for each of you, one for family, and uh, we'd like you just to read this letter, please. Thank you. 